There's no place to escape to. This is the last time. Oh, yes. On the left. <laughs> That's when the cannibalism started. Whale of a tail. <laughs> a whale of a tail. It's be a whale of a tail. <laughs> whale of a tail. Professor Park. Yeah. Professor Park. <laughs> I'm excited about our lessons today. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I hope that um, I hope that you're very gentle uh, on the exam, uh, Professor Park. Yes. Yes. Uh, because uh, a lot of these terms get confused. Yes. Uh, and there's a lot of different. Uh, there's yes. different hooks in the tip. Uh, well, buddy, I hope you figure out what the answers are because I'm cheating off of you. <laughs> I, uh, oh, please, please accept me. <laughs> well, I mean, we'll be friends together. We, that's why we're friends. I cheat off of you, and then you get the answers right, and then I pass the test, and then I invite you to a party, and I let you touch my boob in the dark, pretending I'm a woman. <laughs> this should be the most grateful thing I would ever experience for. <laughs> I know. Please let me learn about whales today. You don't have a chance in hell, buddy. Please we're going to be today. a whale of a tail. <laughs> no Welcome chance. to the last podcast on the left, everyone. Ben, hanging out with Henry and Marcus. Finally, finally, we're going back to the sea. Finally, mm. we've been out of the sea for what, six, eight months now? Not since Blackbeard have we returned to the sea. And during Blackbeard, right, again, yes. we, we discover things. We find out that the pirates obviously were a little bit more liberal, right? It was a fun <laughs> little ship. No, right? it was because, a more oh, no, 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 no. Just because they blow each other out of pure desperation <laughs> for any kind of human contact, that doesn't mean they're liberal. But guess what? <laughs> this time. These guys are sucking dick and they mean it. <laughs> All right? Because these guys are, these are some smelly motherfuckers. Oh, Very smelly. man. You know you come up from the quarters, the main quarters, and be like, uh, buddy, you got a little, uh, I got something on your beard there. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, I've yeah, been sucking the pig leg. <laughs> oh, Marty over here. Oh, the old pig leg. Um, but oh. today, a whale of a tail. A whale of a tail. Whale of a tail. The tragedy of the Essex part one. So in the year 1820. Oh, I can smell it now. <laughs> mm, bread, shit. Yeast infection? In the year 1820, an American whaling vessel called the Essex went down in the South Pacific Ocean after a massive sperm whale attacked and destroyed the ship thousands of miles from even the nearest uninhabited island. And I want to say that was one of Brendan Fraser's greatest performances. <laughs> <laughs> and I am here Current. to tell you he is oh, back. Current. He is cool. He is nice. And it shows you nice guys who were super attractive when they were younger and really got famous because of their beauty can also succeed when they're older and a whale. You see, that's what you do. And what I love is the climax of the film when they cut off the top of his head and dip deep into the white, viscous cream that is the base of his skull. Yes. They went and spent money at the end of it. It was really, it was wild. It was. Unexpected. Well, the 21 souls aboard the Essex sought refuge in the smaller whale boats with limited provisions and only a vague idea of how and where they could be rescued. What followed was a sort of Donner Party at sea. Mm -hmm. A tale of bad luck, bad decisions, and bad leadership. Fatal errors! No! And as a result, two-thirds of the whalers who left the island of Nantucket a year before died horrific deaths on the water. So 14 out of 21, if my math is correct. Something like that. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> something sure, sure, like sure, that. Sure, sure. Well, yeah, you really did well. Something really like good. that or good, 16? Quick I'm not sure. 14. 14. Yeah, 7 times 2 is 14. And then 7 times 3 is 21. Two-thirds dead, 14 dead. Good job, Ben. Thank really you. good work. Well, famously, the destruction of the Essex inspired the climax in Hervin Melville's Moby Dick, which is all the fun stuff that Melville crammed into the inn after making people read hundreds upon hundreds of pages about cytology and coins and endless fucking gams. You love that stuff, Marcus, <laughs> though. I know you love descriptions of gams, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is, you think it means sexy legs, but it no. doesn't. It means a whale party. A gam is a whaling when two whaling ships meet each other and on sea. And they trade like, stories. Oh, ah. so when's the last time you saw a whale? Oh, ah, I saw a whale three weeks ago. ago. Oh, and then I saw another one. Oh, that reminds me of another whale let's, that I saw. Let's talk about it for 40 fucking pages. Yeah, yeah it was called the first ever podcast. <laughs> let's just say that sperm whale is running a little low. <laughs> What? Sucking dick. Yeah, <laughs> it's a that's secret. my story. You got to keep your special secret. <laughs> <laughs> now I know it's an English major. I know the point 
of Moby Dick. I know that it's supposed to mirror the pace of being on a whale ship for months, if not years. Yeah. It's supposed to mirror the long periods of extreme boredom that are punctuated by moments of pure fucking adrenaline. See, Isn't Marcus, it? this is why whoever wrote Moby Dick, Moby himself, I would Herman assume. <laughs> Uh, he needed two friends like Henry and Ben to say, Herman, wrap it up. I'm getting a little <laughs> bored here, Herman. But isn't it one of those books? Because I don't remember because I read Moby Dick or I attempted to read Moby Dick at attempted. least when I was in high school. Yeah. But I think that a lot of it now, it's one of those books where so, like some nerd is always like, but actually it's quite funny. And you're like, <laughs> I, I don't know. I actually, I might be wrong. I'm not certain. No, no I don't think it's actually quite funny. Oh, no. Actually, what you don't understand. This is the this direct screaming parody of wailing life. And it's like, I don't know, man. No, no. It's, it is actually written purposefully to be boring, to mirror the life of a whaling vessel. So that's what it's supposed to actually do is you're supposed to go along the whaling vessel, along the whaling voyage with them so no. you can learn what it's like to be a whaler. And that's why people consider it to be so brilliant. If they can't understand me, how can they reach me? Absolutely. <laughs> if you really want me engaged, right. I need a hell cube. <laughs> I need some tits. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, I need like five more whales. I'm yeah. kind of with you on that, buddy. Herman Melville, who finished the end with any luck, they'll hate it. Yeah. And they did, actually, at the time. He Very did. good. He yeah. was panned. Yeah. Widely panned. Wasn't, wasn't considered, yeah, wasn't born. considered great until after he died. Herman Melville sounds like a Henny Youngman style comedian who only does racist jokes for the king. <laughs> He might have been. Yeah. Well, if the description of long periods of boredom punctuated by extreme action, if that description sounds familiar, studies have suggested that the PTSD suffered by some whalers back in the 19th century is very similar to the sort that soldiers have been experiencing since time immemorial. I don't want to be super stupid here, but what about the fucking whales? <laughs> the whales. <laughs> We're going to get into the whales. Okay, they're because they're sad, right? No, they, some people, yes. Okay, first of all, it's, as we wade into this episode, I understand there's going to be a lot of whale murder in this episode. Mm -hmm. But again, these are viewed as allegorical creatures, right? Like, yeah, at the time, now we love whales. Yeah. Right now, everyone's yeah. like, oh, whales, cute, fun, love it, want to ride one, want to fuck one if I could, right? Sure. Everyone says that. They're all want to have sex with these animals. Everyone right? says that. Oh, I love SeaWorld. <laughs> SeaWorld triple X. <laughs> Absolutely. But, the, but then... Like it's what they talk about in Moby Dick, the idea is the whale is the sort of like a search, an, ex an exhaustive search for something you can't quite catch, right? Mm, it's a, it's yeah. a mysterious beast of the ocean. It's way more of the wave than of the plate. Okay. Now it's a truly capitalist enterprise in which you're raping the the earth in order for maximizing for in order for maximum profits. I mean See, that is that is whaling at its core. No, this whole thing your... is about making luby. For factory machines. You're right. <laughs> Put your ear down to the earth really quick. And what do you hear it say? Yes, I'm fine with it. <laughs> Whoa! Yes. Pocahontas Whoa. was wrong! Yes, yes I'm she fine She was with fucking it. wrong! Oh, yes, indeed. <laughs> I'm happy you finally said it, Henry. Well, when you bring 19th century American whaling down to its essentials, it is a fascinating yet brutal subject. Oh, yeah. See, just as the story of the Donner Party was wrapped up in the frontier exploration of the mid-19th century, so too were vessels like the Essex a major part of sea exploration during roughly the same time, although the sorts of voyages taken by whaling ships were far more intense. They really were, because they all said the same. The reading I was doing talked about how if you were a whaler, you never knew if you were coming back. No. Like, the, as soon as that shit was going, which, kind of, you know, it said a lot of seafaring enterprises at the time that was common, but there was also, like, whaling's an extremely dangerous job. It's almost like we should have figured something else out. <laughs> Yeah, but we but we were our economy was heavily dependent on whales. Yeah, and so we ended up going and getting further and further into this, which is an extremely horrible, horrible job. Well, not to mention you're constantly in the shadow of Bob Marley, and you're like, you know, Bob's great, the Fan whalers, fantastic Bob musician, Marley great lyrics, but yeah. without well. the band, the yeah. whalers, Bob. Nah. Maybe not everyone would get your Rastafarian meanings. Yeah, everyone wonders about the functions of Kissel's jokes and his bon mots and what they are is to drive the story forward yeah. because that's what we do. It's all about endless forward momentum. Oh, yes, show. indeed. I love that Bob Marley song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I feel like you can get permanently canceled just, yes, just for that one. Yeah. Uh, just that one statement. Well, at its core, whaling is close-range hunting on the open sea. It's something closer to a battle. Furthermore, 
You're in what is basically a large rowboat, and you're going up against the largest creature to ever exist in Earth's history, an intelligent creature with a strong will to live. Yeah. Additionally, when hunting certain species of whale, specifically the sort that the Essex was after, whalers embarked on the longest voyages of any hunter in history, sometimes for years-long stretches. And of course, the longer you're out there, the deadlier the voyage has a chance of being. Yeah, because you just get lost, dog. Yeah. And then uh, the way they talk about how, like, it's just confidence in wind. Man, I don't have any confidence in the goddamn wind. It changes every five seconds. <laughs> yeah, it's scary out there. You don't know where, where you're going. Yeah, they don't know they where knew, you're going. They, knew where they, they were don't going, know man. where they're going. <laughs> no, they know what direction they're heading, but do they know where they're going? But a lot of that's spiritual. <laughs> you're talking the difference between plot and story. Yeah. Now, when it comes to the tragedy of the Essex, we actually know quite a bit about the voyage because the first mate wrote a 128-page narrative recounting the tale not too long after he and a few others were rescued amidst the bones of their shipmates. The bones of their shipmates! (laughs) So there you go. Writing does serve a purpose. And this was the accepted story for almost two centuries. But in 1980, an old notebook written by the cabin boy on the Essex, Tommy <laughs> Nickerson. Yeah, I hope we edit on a couple of chapters. <laughs> yeah, he was very fair about the sex, but he did not like to necessarily talk about being a cannibal because he said he didn't want to spend his old age being recognized as one. But I say it's nice because it gives you more room at the supermarket. That's mm-hmm. for dang sure. Well, he was like, what do you mean open about the sex? He didn't talk about the sex. I mean, you just read it off. It's bled off the page. Yeah. It's <laughs> Nothing about but the, the pure word. sensuality. I did look at, we'll get into the sensuality of whalers. Sensuality, crazy. yes. <laughs> well, this notebook, it was identified by a Nantucket whaling expert named Edward Stackpole. I know whaling books. They all <laughs> smell like shit. Yeah. Slick to the touch. Wow. It was identified as absolutely genuine. Okay. And Nickerson was only 14 when he went out on the open sea, but he was 71 when he finally wrote down the story. Holy crap. Okay. So he lived a long life. Mm -hmm. Now, the stories in Nickerson's notebook and the narrative written by first mate Owen Chase, they more or less matched up. But Nickerson's account was more warts and all, which gave the story a much more human flavor. (laughs) (laughs) Devilish devilish gallows humor. It's not foreshadowing if you fucking laugh. (laughs) Yes. Devilish. Will they ever not be rogues? So people are going to people are going to eat each other in this episode. Not this episode, next episode. Next episode. episode. Yeah, next episode. A whole bunch of it. Yeah. Great. Awesome. But as far as our main source for this series goes, we have In the Heart of the Sea by Nathaniel Philbrick, which is an absolutely fantastic account of the Essex tragedy that also features a solid overview of the wild world of Whalen. I'll tell you any- what, they always have to blur out the blowholes, <laughs> which I actually <laughs> think is disgusting. Hey, let's think about this. Free the blowhole. Yeah. I completely agree. Are any, is anyone named like someone without ED? <laughs> is there any masculine names in this? Yeah, what do you mean? Oh, uh, uh, yeah, there's Robert Pollard. Yeah. Okay, that, that works. Yeah, there's Bob, Wilmington the, Climax. <laughs> no! There's Johnny Sucks a Lot. <laughs> oh, there you go. <laughs> that you was his nickname. Yeah. yeah. Now, when whaling was at its height, it was the fifth largest industry in America and extremely profitable. As wow. one expert said, you would be surprised at the profitability of these whales. <laughs> you're just like, I'm dying here, sir. <laughs> well, before the discovery of petroleum, whale oil was the highest quality lubricant that humans could produce. And it made the best candles, which was no small thing in an increasingly industrializing world decades away from electricity. Okay. The smell of this. I Talk about this idea of these, these whale fat candles just yeah. burning and like just leaving a residue, everything. I, I ugh. Ah, but that's why they were actually so expensive because they didn't leave the residue. That's why they uh, didn't burn as much soot. They were said to be the favorite candle of Benjamin Franklin. Oh, oh yeah, wow. You can just see him in the shadows as he turns into the Dracul <laughs> as he's banging a random gal with his big old belly. <laughs> <laughs> he's so, looking into a mental mirror? <laughs> so, no, he was a cool guy. <laughs> but he, But in your mind... Benjamin Franklin was a vampire? Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. like weird. It's a <laughs> whole other all scene. history. I've been trying to get him off this Benjamin Franklin is a vampire thing for a long time. Yeah. It's been up close to 12 years. No, Gary Oldman, when he was the vampire, was shadow. So I'm saying Ben Franklin's shadow so, is you just Yeah, you're so just mashing up a bunch of shit. Again, hurtling forward. Well, well. <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> well, somewhat sneakily, whaling was the industry that made America powerful enough and economically independent enough to separate from England, oh. even if the number one customer for whale oil was the English. It's kind of like massively psychologically and uh, kind of symbolically appropriate mm -hmm. that the thing that allowed America to become what it was at the time period was just the, the absolute devastation of yeah. every whale within yeah. hundreds yeah. of hundreds and hundreds of miles, but then selling that same whale blood mm -hmm. to the very people yes. that were in charge of us in the first place. Mm -hmm. But somehow that kept us separate because it seems like money was the only thing that anybody cared about. Yeah. It seems like it's a country founded by blubber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh. oh yes, the re it's kind of like the wreck of the Exodus. It's like the wreck of the uh, the Edmund Fitzgerald. Oh, I love but if that. But Edmund song. ate Fitzgerald. <laughs> <laughs> but when it came to the whaling industry in America, it had always been centered around the weird little island of Nantucket, just off of Cape Cod in Massachusetts, which by the 19th century had come to define itself in every aspect as a whaling community. In fact, one prevailing Nantucket myth said that one of the founders, a man named Ichabod Paddock, had been, quote, swallowed by a whale, in whose belly he found the devil and a mermaid playing gods for soul. I think you stole that from Jonah Yeah, the no, Bible. It's, no, but again, allegorical. <laughs> allegorical. No, Jonah didn't. He didn't find the devil and a mermaid playing cards uh, for a soul. That's a fantastic, that's a fantastic image. It's yeah. cool. It's a good scrimshaw art piece you'd buy at a farmer's market. It sounds like you went to a <laughs> casino called The Whale. <laughs> but when it came to the types of whales that originally brought the English to Nantucket, they started with what they called right whales. Ben. Do you know why they were called right whales? Pop quiz, hotshot. Let's see how he fucks this up. <laughs> because he thinks Ben you're in Franklin's Dracula. <laughs> because whenever you were thinking about a candle and you were getting in the mood with your girl, the whale was right there. You say, and the whale is cucking you. They're watching you from the side, <laughs> like a man in a hotel room. Yeah. Um, so whales from the sea just. Ooh, I'll be your candle. Okay, <laughs> I'll be your candle. It's incorrect. Um, no, it's I incorrect. would assume because they go to the rights. No, no, it was because it was the right whale to kill. That's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. <laughs> no, my answer was better. <laughs> it is just more obvious than you'd think. Yeah, that's how they get you on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire. Yeah, it's the. <laughs> that's how they get you. The final question isn't always that difficult. No, that's no. what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. play in the mind. It's and you're just looking journey. at Regis Philbin, <laughs> sweating there, sweating, <laughs> looking at him, and he's just there going, "It's unbelievable." <laughs> He's been dead for a long yep. time. Yeah, I don't know who runs that show anymore. No idea. Well, right whales were actually baleen whales, and their beached bodies had been harvested by the Wampanoag people of Massachusetts for centuries. You know, I once knew a man from Nantucket who oh, God, don't did do that. what? What did he do? What was his thing? What was his fucking deal, Henry? Genocided a whole group of Native Americans <laughs> that were there originally. Yeah, you knew him. That's yeah, great. Yeah. But in 1712... A man named Captain Hussey spotted a new whale off the coast of Nantucket. New whale on the block. <laughs> wow. Its blubber was superior to that of a right whale, providing a brighter and cleaner burning light. But what truly made this new whale special was what they found when they cracked open its skull. These guys are so fucked up. That's <laughs> the first thing they thought of. <laughs> what like, was crack there? open its fucking head. Let's see what its fucking brains are like. <laughs> what else yeah. did What else are you going to do? I don't know. You're right. I don't know. You'd be the only one that shows up with a spoon. <laughs> now, upon first exposing the fluid contained in the creature's head to oxygen, it looked sort of like vodka. But as the fluid oxidized, it came to look a lot more like cum. Mm -hmm. oh. So they named the substance spermaceti. And they, called the, nice. <laughs> and they called the creature the sperm whale. That's how it's got its stupid yep. name? 100% true, my friend. And the, the, watching oh, these wait, documentaries, hold on a sec. So they seriously. Cut, so this is the most dude way ever to name something. <laughs> cut open the top of a fucking animal you don't know's head. Yo, bro, you looks just like... saw this animal for the first time. Yo, fucking Henry, man. You think that looks like cum, dude? <laughs> fucking holy fucking shit. What did my older the, brother here earlier? What the cum whale, dude? <laughs> holy fucking but shit, like, dude. like medical. Sperm. Sperm whale. Bro, looks like a whole bunch of guys from my gym were in there recently. <laughs> no, it is uh, the pleasure I had of watching so many of these historians 
trying to we because again <laughs> we, we are I'm children here yeah, right? of we're, course, we're children of course, we're highly of they're the children <laughs> they fucking were like looks like cool <laughs> <black moon." laughs> but it's these watching academians just being like and named after the male ejaculate like <laughs> trying to say the terms ejaculate or spermaceti and yeah. they can't figure out how to say it and they're but de- but they can't smile no, no one's allowed to laugh no one's no. allowed to do anything their favorite euphemism is Seminal fluid. Seminal fluid. Yeah, it looks it's so much up. dirtier than cum. <laughs> shut up. Because seminal fluid is what you scrape off a corpse. Oh, cum, gosh. at least everyone's alive in the room. Right, yeah. No one could certainly say that they named this thing the sperm whale simply because the stuff looks like cum. Doesn't have to be sexual. <laughs> just looks like cum and that's that. That's just yeah. right there. It's, it's just like, sure. it looks like cum. Great. Because right. they didn't have as much icing then. <laughs> right, so you use that, kind of scoop that up there. But there seemed to be something about spermaceti that made writers weirdly sexual, but not necessarily horny, if you get my meaning. Yes. I do not. (laughs) So that means that they're writing half hard. You'll see. Half hard. So in Moby Dick, the protagonist and narrator, Ishmael, called me Ishmael. Right. He experienced a sort of ecstasy as he squeezed the lumps of fresh spermaceti out of the head of the recently murdered sperm whale. This is what Ishmael said, and this is written by Herman Melville, who worked on a whaling vessel himself. I found myself unwittingly squeezing my co-laborer's hands and mistaking their hands for the gentle globules. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because it's like when people say about paper factories, they when it smells like farts, it like yeah. smells like money. Yeah, is that these guys are like that? If you as you read about whalers, because we'll get into how they render the oil and blah blah blah. But they said these disgusting things. They, it was worth so much money. No, I I get it. It doesn't mean that they have to like take got great joy in popping the. Like Dr. Pimple Popper. Or, uh, Here's another example. An 1874 memoir from a whaler named William M. Davis told of how luxurious it was to wade into pots of spermaceti to squeeze and strain out the fibers, ah, where, where he, quote, almost fell in love with the touch of my own poor legs. Ah, this yes. is the brain <laughs> of a fucking whale they're talking they about, right? Scurry. They used to be, because it was so worth it. The yeah. money, it was the... Wait, wait, okay, can I just add? So what are they getting out of the sperm? Like spermaceti. That and shit. that's the candle. That's, that goop, that's the candle, yeah. That's what the they're making the candle. The center of a sperm whale's head was worth more money than any other substance on Earth so at the time. So they didn't use any, what did they, did they use the blubber from the body as well? We'll get into all of the blubber. Okay. We'll get into but the whole thing. No, they didn't just like, it wasn't like uh, they used to do with the buffalo in the Wild West where they kill it, cut off the, cut off the fur, and then just fucking leave the corpse there. No, they used every part of the whale. Actually, so you that's to- not true. I learned about it because they were noticed to how that that's how they would find whaling expeditions later on where they went was because they'd find the piles of dead because they would use chunks of much as they could. Yeah. But the rest of it, they'd leave. Well, they, no, not every part of the whale, yeah. but they'd use the blubber. They weren't just remnants. using the head. You they just were find doing these the whole thing. floating like islands of rotting whale meat oh, just yeah. out in the ocean. Of course. No, because the sailors didn't like whale meat. They say it was too tough. Too I gamey. Be- I believe it. I believe so it. So they'd rather eat Jeff. <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that. So it's like, so they got this candle that comes from the cum of the brain of the whale, then they package it, and then they put a little spruce in it, and they call it Christmas tree, and they sell it to your grandmother? Oh, no. Well, let's think of it this way. Like, this is before electricity, so this is the only way you're seeing at night. How is Ben Franklin going to write at night if he doesn't have his candles? Yeah, this And think about where America would be then, my friend. Think about there. Think about how how Jonathan Harker would not have possibly (laughs) gone through what he went through visiting Benjamin Franklin in Philadelphia. Which the whole book, Dracula's all about a real estate deal. It really is. It very much is. All right. Yeah. Well, the thing about sperm whales is that the spermaceti came with a greater risk. Mm. Sperm whales were far more aggressive than baleen whales, and they were found further away from shore. But the quality of their oil was far higher than that Mm. of a baleen whale. So for many, the reward outweighed the risk. Now, of course, whalers immediately slaughtered every sperm whale they could find within the immediate vicinity of New England. So they had to range further and further out to kill and find them. Real smart there. Problem was, it wasn't profitable to sail for three months, kill a whale, and sail another three months back with this whole whale carcass. 
So whale ships were turned into ghoulish floating factories where whalers could kill, butcher, and process carcass after carcass until the hold was filled to the brim with whale oil. Just, uh, just fucking uh, jiggling, <laughs> yeah. gelatinous, stank because they because uh, uh, the smell is supposed to be just absolutely fucking pure. Oh, I'm sure, it's supposed to be the worst smell on earth. I can see the Amazon Smile logo that also looks like a penis. Now that you think about it, you and won't. Think about it. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, mine just... always has mine has that big golf club like swing at the very end of it. My <laughs> penis goes is a full L. It's actually not a bad design if that's where the G spot is of the gal. That's your partner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, but it mm-hmm. depends on how far mine is. Like it's pointing back at me. Yeah, <laughs> it's really weird. It's unfortunate it's anatomy. Very weird. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, then and only then could a whale ship return to Nantucket after the entire hold was full of whale oil. Oh. God, they must have really, you must have known that they were coming they yeah. said that a they mile did. away. They did. And as a result, whaling voyages turned from seasonal affairs that may have lasted like nine months at most yeah. to years-long voyages. And likewise, the distance traveled became almost unfathomable. 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 By the late 1700s, Nantucket whale ships could be found in the Arctic Circle, the west coast of Africa, wow. and the east coast of South America. In fact, the British Navy used to complain that everywhere they went, expecting to find nothing and nobody, they'd find Nantucket whalers, having whaled <laughs> the fuck out of the area long before anyone else even thought of going there. I just see a lot of robust women with, with their underwear sticking out of the top of their pants when we talk about this. But I also know that this yeah. is because these were the factories that this whale oil allowed us to have the entire industrial revolution inside of America. Mm. Like it's the stuff that went into all of the machines. So they were desperate. And the people that were paying for these whale boats were people like the Macy family, Mm -hmm. the Folgers family. We're all like, these are people like huge American quote unquote dynasties. We're like also needing this blubber. Yeah. Whaling is like the secret history of America. Okay. As far as who those Nantucket whalers were, they were mostly Quakers. Pacifists when it came to humans, but fucking demons when it came to whales. Mm. See, the Nantucket Quakers were extreme weirdos, because as we all know, the smaller the island, the stranger the folk. Absolutely. Live from your grave. Stamps.com has postage rates you literally can't find anywhere else, like up to 84% off USPS and UPS. It used to cost five barrels of wine to send one single mare from one county to another. Can you even believe this? For 25 years, Stamps.com has been indispensable for over one million businesses. And if you sell products online, I know I do because my words are products. Stamps.com seamlessly connects with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Use Stamps.com to print postage wherever you do business. All you need is a computer and a printer, and they even send you a free scale. But they don't send you a mailman because now you're the mailman. And guess what? I can be as drunk as I want when I deliver the mail. Set your business up for success. When you started with Stamps.com today, sign up with promo code LEFT for a special offer that includes a four-week trial plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. Just go to Stamps.com, click the microphone at the top of the page, and enter code LEFT. Now, whaling was such a part of Nantucket life that children were taught whaling terms from birth, and bedtime stories usually involved killing whales or eluding cannibals, as one might imagine doing when you regularly deal with isolated South Pacific islands. I can't sleep, Daddy. You want to tell me another whale story? Okay, let me tell you a story. So it was me and my buddy Paul, right? yeah. and we were on top of this whale. It was beached on a, oh, a beach, right? We, we, we got up on there, and I said, "Oh, Paul, you can take the hole. You did such a good haul yesterday. <laughs> oh. I'm climbing up in the mouth. I'm gonna come in his ass backwards." <laughs> <laughs> you know, listen, get it, sit down, lay down, lay down. This is a story. This is how I afforded a private school. <laughs> this is great, Daddy. <laughs> well, speaking of which, there were whaling groupies. There were secret societies of young women who swore to only marry a man who had killed a whale. See? <laughs> I don't know what I'm trying to say, but see, there used to be a time where a man was respected for his job. Well, these men could be identified by the pens they wore on their lapel to show that they'd indeed been blooded by blubber. It's always clout. Yeah, always. Nantucketeers even had their own toasts, not to life itself, but to good whaling. Oh. They would raise their glasses and say, quote, 
Death to the living, long life to the killers, success to sailors' wives, and greasy luck to the whalers. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. I'm actually going to be doing Dry January. Um, so <laughs> I won't be able to. No, I can tell when one. you're doing it because I can just I can smell the monster. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and indeed, greasy luck was needed. Oh. Because whaling was a deadly business. In 1810, a quarter of the women in Nantucket over the age of 23 had been widowed by the sea in one way or another, and four of the youngest crew members on the ill-fated Essex had either lost fathers or were total orphans. I mean, widowed by the sea is one thing. Have you ever been? DP'd by the moon? Oh, it's <laughs> brutal. <laughs> brutal. <laughs> brutal. Absolutely horrific what that moon can do. So if you're the lady, they didn't love the guys. They just knew they were going to die young and they'd get a pension. <laughs> well, actually, let's get right into that. You're not Please. too far off. God. <laughs> but perhaps out of emotional necessity or complete honesty, the Quaker women of Nantucket seemed to revel in the fact that their husbands were constantly gone or in some cases, dead. Oh, is this why Natalie keeps asking me when we're going back on tour? <laughs> This is unbelievable. <laughs> See, in Quakerism, the sexes were considered intellectually equal, and the women of Nantucket maintained a complex web of personal and commercial relationships that kept Nantucket going while the men were away. Typically, a woman could expect to see her husband for three to four months every two to three years. Whoa. So they didn't love these men. <laughs> <laughs> they liked the blubber. Yeah. Yes, they did. You're, she's making blubber money. No, they're doing their own. They're pulling their own weight. They're yeah. building the youth. I in Nantucket. Yeah. Well, so comfortable were these women with this arrangement that they even had a song celebrating how great it was to be married to someone they saw only briefly every once every few years. Here are but a few lines. With his brow so nobly open and his dark and kindly eye, oh, my heart beats fondly towards him whenever he is nigh. But when he says goodbye, my love, I'm off across the sea. First I cry for his departure, then laugh because I I'm free. Well, it sounds horrible. <laughs> horrible. Yeah, I'm one of the rougher wives. Yeah. And you wonder why God volunteers for all these trips when it comes down to it. I suck a mean dick and I make a great shouter. You do. Yes, indeed. So everyone's happy. No, it's a, it's a fun, like, role reversal. It's the whole thing. It's like, yeah, the wife's away for the weekend, but it's the same thing. Like, oh, thank God my husband's gone. I can't stand that motherfucker. I don't think that's a role reversal. That's the rules. <laughs> Actually, I do kind of feel like maybe it comes down to your husband might be riddled with PTSD from wrestling with one of the most violent <laughs> animals that ever existed in the way in which he has to do it. And he's mm. the, uh, just a, a, a fucking gear in the cog, cog in yeah. this whole fucking endless wheel mm -hmm. of, of the whale industry that he's stuck on. Yeah. PTSD, STDs, you start seeing your wife as a whale. Yeah. You, ever seen a C, <laughs> you ever had a C transmitted disease? No. <laughs> I was stung by a jellyfish once. They can sting you even when they're dead. Oh, kind of cool. Mm, that you remember cool. that about me. Yeah, I, I, you can sting even when you're dead. Wink. The jellyfish. Oh. No, I mean, you might have a bit of a point there. The, um, an earlier verse of that song did talk about how much I love to spend whaling money when my <laughs> yeah, husband yep. is gone. Yeah, I mean, again, you're in it for the blubber. Yeah, you're in it for I the blubber. I know what's going on. And when it came to being truly independent, Nantucket women were quite forward thinking for the 19th century. Reportedly, a common item found in the bedside drawer of a Nantucket home was a six inch plaster dildo oh. euphemistically called a he's at home a he's at home i'm just so happy that they didn't go they didn't like oh i don't know exaggerate too much <laughs> like a six inch dildo six is inch. just fine it's That's just all fine we need. it's, it's all a good. humble dildo <laughs> it is because again it's not because wait hey you don't want to come like replace him you yeah. want to miss no. him that's yes. the idea is that you give it i'd say four inches well <laughs> just so that you get yeah. a little bit that's just a normal a, that's a normal yeah. four inches, but yeah. also remember it's made of plaster and it's going to be very rigid so if you get like oh. a plaster eight incher in there that's going to be too much because the good thing about the eight inchers when you get the rubber ones you know they're flexible but plaster yeah. ugh. have you ever seen one uh he's at home look at that look at this big old fucking crazy head on it Wow. She was expecting a lot. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow, holy shit. Apparently, was according to this one woman, she says that it, she felt that it was mostly myth about the he's at home. But I think uh -huh. that's just because she already got one locked up and she doesn't understand why anybody needs Yeah, why would it be myth? I mean, people masturbate all the time. Yeah. But when it came to the whalers, they lived, as is tradition for romanticized American professions of yore, absolutely fucking awful lives mm. of hardship, exploitation, injury, and frequent death, all while being expected to fulfill half a dozen areas of expertise. 
Whalers in the 1800s were sailors, hunters, butchers, explorers, factory workers, and merchants all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And yet whaling was one of the lowest paying jobs in America. Why? Because literally put the Amazon logo. logo all of on the it. money went up to the top. Every all yeah. of the money went up to the top, and every one of these ships were bought into. They were all like time shared buildings. They were all mm. owned by families that then would hire out the crews. So it's like all of the money is getting more and more diluted. It's basically the way American corporations are run today. Right, whaling ships were the blueprint. It all began with whaling ships. But during the industry's peak in the mid-19th century, ordinary seamen on a whale ship earned just about the same as women working in textile factories in Massachusetts. Two-thirds of what they would have made if they just moved to Boston as unskilled laborers. But yeah. then you don't get the stories. Yeah. I guess not. Put into perspective, the cabin boy who wrote the memoir of the sinking of the Essex was paid the modern equivalent of $3,500 for two years of labor. That's it? For two. two years of labor. Although room and board was technically included in the deal. The Honestly, room and the board is a goddamn ship that smells like scum from And whale. you should be thankful <laughs> for it. Now, concerning the Essex, it was a relatively old ship when it set off for its last voyage in 1819. It had been in service for 20 years and had gone through numerous repairs, but the ship owners, who should have long since retired it, they sent it out again and again while also refusing to do any repairs until they were absolutely necessary. They didn't care. Wouldn't you love to find out that this boat that you're going to go spend three years on to go hunt one of the dangerous, most dangerous animals in the water? For, for everybody else's money, not yours. Yeah. But if you found out that the guys that owned it, because this was the attitude of the X6, were just being like, we think we can squeeze one more trip out of it. <laughs> yeah. It and like, that's like it. Can you imagine being on a plane <laughs> and hearing the, the, them being like, we think we can get one more? I mean, that's literally the story of Leonard Skeenard, yeah. where they're like, we're going to have to repair this when we land. We'll pick <laughs> up and we'll fix it up after take up. It's like, God dang, setting themselves up to eat each other, apparently. Yeah. Well, as we said, you know, a vessel like the Essex was sort of like a modern corporation in which people could own shares of the ship. And most men who bought whale ship shares own shares in multiple ships. So if one ship went down, no big whoop. I no. mean, but 20 people are dead, but that's not you. Yeah, that's, that's a you. no big whoop. That's yeah. a no big whoop because it's yeah. not you. It's not you. But what that meant was that also like modern corporations, the shareholder was king. Corners were cut and costs were kept to a minimum. And besides its old age, the Essex was severely underprovisioned when it set out because it was accepted practice to nearly starve sailors for years at a time to maximize shareholder profits. Great. Good for them. They're just like ExxonMobil today. They're just like and oil. Yeah. The oil business. But since shit always flows downhill, the whalers of Nantucket also took every opportunity to fuck over anyone who came in from the outside to join the whaling life. I get it, man. You, if you want to be a part of this, it's quarter, it's like a, it's kind of like almost like a cult-like mentality. Of yeah. Like, yeah. you want to do this thing that sucks? <laughs> well, I'm going to show you how much it sucks because it sucks. Yeah, because it sucked for me, so now it's got to suck double for you. Right. It doesn't, why? What now, why are you volunteering to do it? It's got, yeah, are you hey, on man. the lamb? Are you running away from the law? The, What's the going law, on? Also, the yeah. love of the sea. Yeah, we'll get to it here in a second. <sighs> I mean, inexperienced sailors were called green hands, and Nantucket children would actually wait on the docks for green hands to arrive so they could make fun of them for their poor life choices when they showed up. Oh, you like going out on that stupid boat there? <laughs> oh, you like to, hey, hey, oh, fuck you. You're going to be dead. You're going to die out there. Why are they doing it? Why are they children. yelling at They're them? Because it's, you know, yeah. it's fun. And furthermore, once the green hand arrived on the island, everyone around him's talking in nautical terms all the time in a bizarre accent that says aisle Aile. instead of oil and sherp instead of sharp, all while they're still using thee and thou because they're a bunch of Quakers. Yes. It's they really, they, they were idiosyncratic. Yes. Are they warder people? Warder. warder. Yeah, they're warder? definitely warder. Yeah. No, I, I, I thought warder was the uh, oh, Baltimore area. The, That's no, like warder the, is also Boston. Word. Warder. Or is that no, Philly? No, Wada. No, the Boston's Wada. Wada. Warder, I think, is also, isn't that Philly as well? I don't know. Warder. We're going to get into it. Oh, warder. God. We just wow. don't know. Every one of these Iowa. counties, we're going to get fucking, and all of, every one of these counties, yeah, we're going to hear from, from you. Grum Bip County every is going to fucking them. get so mad. Mm -hmm. When I worked at Burger King, the general manager, big old gal, looked like a whale herself. She said, Warder. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> always always moving forward. Always moving back. Burger King. <laughs> always moving, moving forward. forward. <laughs> always moving back to fast food employment, <laughs> then always. moving forward moving again. Forward, yeah. Also, the 1980s logo of Burger King and the 1990s logo, extremely similar. <laughs> it's true. Again, <laughs> extremely similar. Looking well, forward. Well, once a green hand went to sign up for a voyage, no one told them about any of the pitfalls. And they did this as a rule. 
For example, a longer voyage did not mean more wages. And all experienced Jeez. sailors knew that. Oh, yeah. Sailors signed up for a fraction of the voyage's net profit. It was called a lay. But they never told the green hands because the green hands wouldn't sign up if they knew that. Yeah, no one would because you told about what you catch, yeah. right? So there's no guaranteed pay. So you have to go. So you could go out there, have your hands torn from your body by right. ropes, come back with nothing and pay and be paid nothing. Actually, you could come back in debt. Yeah. A lot of guys went out on their first voyage. A lot of them came back and found that they had been paid either the equivalent of pennies a day or they would be hundreds of dollars in debt to the whaling company. Always right. read your contracts. And if you can't read... Uh, you better learn real fast. Learn within five minutes. Yeah. I mean, it seems like they did it for the experience anyway. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. of them did. I mean, Herman Melville did. Did he actually whale? Yeah. Yeah. He was yeah, he yeah. was obsessed with it. Yeah. Yeah. He actually, he went out on a whale. Yeah. He wrote Moby Dick from 100% experience. Is that right? Yeah. Oh. But the thing is that, you know, they had to keep the green hands in the dark because everybody except the man at the bottom needed to be in on the system. They needed to right. exploit somebody for the whole thing to work. Absolutely. Now, when it came to the Essex, it was actually considered a lucky ship because it had lasted through so many voyages. And as we will, as you may or may not know, we talked a little bit in the Pirates episode and other episodes, sailors are extremely superstitious. Extremely, yes. It was a large ship at 87 feet, and the last several voyages had been captained by a man named Daniel Russell, who'd since been promoted to captain of a new and larger ship called the Aurora. That meant that Russell's first mate, George Pollard. I said Robert Pollard earlier. I think that's the guy who's in Guided by Voices. I might be. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know. Well, George Pollard had earned a command, so he was promoted to captain of the Essex, and his harpooner, Owen Chase, was moved up to first mate for what was, unbeknownst to them, the ship's last voyage. Yeah, man, Owen Chase, the ultimate fucking doom-filled Zoomer. Yeah. He was yeah. just, the, he was literally, this is the equivalent, we'll, we'll talk about it, but Owen Chase is uh, you can only listen to your intern so much. <laughs> I guess so. All right. So they got a promotion. Mm -hmm, they did. To hell. <laughs> <laughs> well, as far as the other men on the voyage went, you had your normal crew of youngsters aged 15 to 18. Four kids named Thomas Nickerson, Barzillay Ray. That's, that's a great name. It's a Barzillay Ray is a wonderful name. Or yeah. it's either Barzillay or Barzillaya. Barzillaya. Yeah. Oh, Barzillay. I like Barzillay. Yeah. You also had Charles Ramsdell and Owen Coffin. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, Coff he was the goth one. Yeah, oh. well, he was of the Nantucket coffins. Oh, oh yeah, that was their um, there was their ladies softball team. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Coffins were actually a well-respected family on the island. Oh, there were okay. the Coffins, there were the Starbucks. The Starbucks were a huge family. Oh, man. And, but they are not of the Starbucks of the Starbucks family. They no. were inspired by the, the Moby Dick book. I looked that up. Yeah, yeah Starbucks yeah, yeah. is not the last name. It's Howard Schultz that created Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. that guy did it. Yeah, Starbucks yeah. is a character. My in president. My <laughs> <laughs> He'll always be my president. Yeah, that's, that's pretty great. Uh, yeah, yeah, so it's the Coffin family. And I'll tell you one thing, Jerry Sneezer. Uh, they, they started Stupid. Little Caesars. No, I won't. And then, oh my God, Amy no. Queefs. Did no, you know that's, the Queefs no, I'm worse. That's even yeah, worse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, it's nothing nothing like Barry Shart or you can imagine anything. Anything. This anything. is funny. Well, a first name with a, a funny last name. Last you can name. Anything, anything, can, anything. Anything can be funny. Anything. Here, if the words are Absolutely, funny. Absolutely, yeah. You too can podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, uh, I did want one of the researchers I was looking at because the 200 year anniversary of this sinking of the Essex mm -hmm. was in November of 2020. And so I was watching these wow. poor Nantucket historians, very frail, <laughs> both in masks, very masked. 20 feet away from each other, trying to be interesting. It was very, very yeah. difficult. Oh, difficult, but, yeah. But one of them kept saying, like, oh, well, well, he was, uh, he did some research into the family connections on Nantucket. And he's like, you know what's interesting is that everyone was cousins. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> interesting, yes. In, a t in an island of 7,000 people, yeah, they, everyone was cousins. They were all fucking each other. <laughs> all right. Uh, well, also, Owen Coffin was the cousin of Captain George Pollard. Exactly. Okay. And that's the thing. For Nantucketers, a whaling voyage was the first step towards a long and profitable career so long as you made your way to a mate's position or, if you were lucky, a captain. Yeah, I mean, it was somewhat interns, you know, at least the Nantucketers. There was a way path forward. But for everyone else on the ship, a whaling voyage was a desperate last resort. Oh. You did not want to end up on a whaling ship. No. But in many ways that the rest of America was not, whaling ships were just the tiniest bit more egalitarian. Just a bit. 
and it was one of the few places where a black man could be paid the same as a white man. Although he still- Very little. (laughs) Very little. (laughs) Yeah, he still couldn't expect to be treated, housed, or fed the same, but he could at the very least be paid the same. But that's also because of the Quakers' view, because they were anti-slavery. Yeah, very much so. But that is to say, seven black sailors signed up for the last voyage of the Essex, the last crew members to do so. And with the standard number of 21 men aboard, the Essex set sail for what was supposed to be a fairly routine two-year-long whaling voyage in August of 1819. Now, George Pollard was already well acquainted with the Essex, having spent four years aboard as second and first mate. But this was his first voyage as captain. Likewise, it was Owen Chase's first voyage as first mate. And if all went well, Pollard could be promoted to captain of a new ship following this voyage, and Chase could be put in command of the Essex. We got to be careful. This is why you can't train. I'm sorry, Fernando. We can't train the producers too well because <laughs> yeah. all they're looking, they're looking at the back of your head, right? Yeah. They're looking at your back of your head wondering, when do I get to have the headphones on? Yeah. When do I get to get over there, right? Well, the uh, Fernando does a great job as uh, one of the co-hosts. He's of crushing Abel's it. Contact, he's so he's so already he's, doing it. He's, yeah, he's already, already doing it. It's he's beginning. It. He's done it. It's over. Wow. He's right there. It's happening. You can hear, the sh- you can hear everything you're saying. <laughs> he's staring at you. He's staring at the back of my head. That's where we're all going. <laughs> Fatal error. <laughs> and so, after the captain gave his speech on the first day of the voyage, as was okay, tradition. Okay, guys, just so you know. Yeah. Looking for whales, number one. Yeah. <laughs> biggest fish you're going to see today. The whale. So, if you're, yeah, yeah. so if you're curious, is that a fish or a whale? Is it bigger than you? Yeah. It's a whale. Okay, number two. <laughs> Let's keep the farts to the top of the boat, okay? Okay. I don't need everybody farting in the bottom of the boat because it's already getting me smelly enough, okay? Good team. All right, every break. Good team. Can I kill a dolphin? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And just show it to me so we can all have fun have watching it scream, okay? All right. We love screams here. Great. Uh, well, uh, dolphins, speaking of which, uh, they actually liked dolphin meat a little bit more than whale meat, but they didn't really like eating dolphins that much. And it was actually very hard to kill a dolphin because they had only the harpoon to use, oh. and a dolphin's hide is very thick. Yeah. That's why you would use dynamite. <laughs> yeah, I've seen the uh, very sad documentary. Very sad. Yeah. But the Essex pushed off with high hopes and big expectations from the people in charge. High stakes. High why, stakes. why the hope? Because, well, because Pollard is, he's, it's a very old ship. Okay. So he's been promoted to captain, but he knows I got to get this ship. Is, there's no future on the Essex. So I got to do a great job on this so I can get promoted to a bigger ship. And okay. Chase is thinking like, okay, this ship maybe has two voyages left in it. If I get promoted this next time, that I can also get promoted. So it's these all these again, oh, man. Yikes. It is a corporate yeah. ladder that it is. all yeah. these guys are desperately trying to climb. All and right, they- let me teach you one thing about being a CEO. You see that carrot? You see it's in front of that person's nose. You pull it back. You pull it back. Pull make it back. Jump. And make then jump. make them jump. <laughs> but it's it is also it, you cannot overestimate just to, and over say how valuable whale oil was. Yeah. yeah. And and so every single time they were trying to get this shit, it was always a high priority yeah. for them for the people up top. But for the people on the bottom, the green hands, the voyage was immediately a nightmare. Most found themselves so seasick they were ready to die. Have you ever been seasick? Yeah, dude. It's fucking. Remember my face blew up? Yeah. You remember that? Half of my face got swollen because we went on a little expedition to go fishing. Oh, it was horrible. Well, but that was right up until they got what was called the Nantucket Cure. To Uh cure seasickness. Tell me this is not going to get sexual. No, well, (laughs) well, the sick man would be made to swallow a piece of pork fat tied to a string, which would then be yanked back out. Can you think about this? I I explained this to Natalie. How does this make you feel better? (laughs) You puke, I guess. I guess, but if that didn't work, you know what they do? What? They do it again. And if that didn't work, they do it again. And they do it again and again and again until the person stopped being sick or just started lying about yep, feeling I'm better. Not, I'm, you know what? Wow, doctor. <laughs> that's the best medicine I've ever had. Thank you so much. I'm done with that. I think it's more the latter. Yeah. yeah. Now, like most whale ships of the era, the Essex took an indirect route following the Gulf Stream of the Atlantic. They're going, trying to go down towards the southernmost tip of South America. They're trying to pop around over into the Pacific. You swing around Cape Horn. Yeah. But this route 
took them all the way to North Africa, where they planned to stop off at the Azores Islands for provisions before sailing back towards Cape Horn. But just three days out of Nantucket, the Essex was ravaged by a storm that almost sank the ship. Yeah, three dude. fucking days. It's just, it, there was a lot of, because I feel like there was there was a couple of other bad omens, because they talked about how there was like, I there was a storm, there was something else that happened on the island. Did someone they, saw like a weird... Yes, they yeah, saw a cryptid. They saw a weird thing. Yeah, they said yeah. they walked... Like a dragon or something. They said that there was like a oh, sighting a of a they sea monster. They saw a sea monster, that's they, what it was. They, they talked about, and, 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 uh, but again, so superstitious, everyone was like... Yeah. Immediately skittish about the boat leaving because mm-hmm. it was like this weird harbinger of doom around it. Yeah, that's not a sea monster. That's my wife. My <laughs> wife. Thank you very much. Very good stuff. <laughs> well, even though Pollard had been on the Essex for years, he froze up when the storm blew in, and because he <laughs> hesitated in giving the order to turn, the Essex was almost tipped over, and two whale boats on deck were destroyed in the ensuing chaos. Oh my! Dude, my promotion. But you know, <laughs> literally. The, I didn't know that this could even happen. So a wind hit it. He just did it. He fucked up. He choked. Yeah. He fucked up. He stirred the wrong. He, st- he steered the ship the wrong way. Wind hit it straight on. It went completely sideways. And they had to wait for a wind if it was gonna come to come and pick them back up. Jesus. Literally, like because they, and they just sat because otherwise they're like he's like one of the thing notes I read that was like well the best part is that when the ship's sideways is that at least it protects you from the wind. That and is so nice. then they're just stuck inside of a, a si- like everyone's gripping. Hey, Hanging from the sides of the boat. Oh and shit. my god! Yeah, and the cook had to like dive out of the kitchen because all of his stoves and shit just fucking flew to the other side of the oh, room and almost crushed him. The poor fat cook. <laughs> what the hell am I supposed to work? I need some <laughs> <these conditions. laughs> Live from your grave. Now, the Essex was still seaworthy after the uh, storm, but it was certainly weakened. But the loss of two whaleboats was a big deal because a ship needed three whaleboats and two to spare if it wanted to have a successful journey. And sure enough, Captain Pollard rightly decided that the voyage was a bust and a return to Nantucket for replacement boats and repairs was needed. You're only three days out. Yeah. What's the fucking difference? Get back. But his first and second mates disagreed, Uh-oh. saying that all that could be taken care of once they arrived in Africa. It is. This is why I say the intern from hell, right? Because yeah. Owen oh. Chase, he worked his way up. But they basically sat and he was like, you know, we need to turn around. We need, we're going to, we're going to repair. We're only three days out. We can just go, we yeah, can repair, we can turn back around. It's a carnival cruise. But it is the literally the equivalent of the new weird Nepo baby hire you bring to your CEO sphere, right? You got the 23-year-old son of your VP <laughs> who's got a cell phone in hand looking at Twitter. He's like, but do you think that... How do you think Twitter will respond? <laughs> like, literally, it's that vibe where you just oh, like, man. you're going to freak out the sailors. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, you need, I know you might be Captain Nolan, <laughs> but like... I got here. I just arrived here. Yeah. And so I might I'm know a little blood. bit more. I'm, I'm like a, blood. I'm well, new blood. Yeah. I'm a new direction. <laughs> I'm a new vibe here. <laughs> and so still... you might need to think about what you're doing and we need to actually do the opposite of what you're doing. I know you're in charge, but it's still up to the captain to make the right decision. You're though. right. Yes, it is. And you know, it's not the worst call because you know, the morale of the sailors, it's pretty low. They're three days yeah. out of a two year journey and they've already almost died. Everything's all fucked up. Yeah. Not to mention, if they went home, they would, the amount of lesbian action they'd see as they enter their home. Like, as their wife was like, I wasn't expecting you for another year and hey. two years, basically. <laughs> we were doing the maiden crisscross. <laughs> oh, no. And so Pollard was swayed by his men for the first, but certainly not the last time, to make the wrong decision. Now, predictably, when they got to the Azores Islands, there were no spare whale boats to be purchased. Likewise, when they continued south to the Cape Verde Islands, they only found that there was but one spare whale boat to buy. And so, after trading 30 starving hogs that were almost skeletons for half a barrel of beans, or of course, actually, they traded the beans for the hogs. Wait a second, they had a bunch of pigs on board this whole time? No, it's going to get even weirder than just the pigs. Yeah, it gets weirder than that. I'd listen to the pigs. (laughs) Well, after they got all these starving hogs on board, they continued on their journey towards South America, one boat down. But then, halfway between Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires, three months into the journey, the crew heard a cry from the lookout for the first time. Oh my God, it was all those angry birds trying to kill the pigs. Thar she blows! <laughs> now, when the crew heard either thar she blows, thar she breaches, or thar goes flukes, oh yeah, all perfectly reasonable signals meaning, hey, there's a whale, 
Everyone on the ship jumped into action. Dargo's flukes is a really good thing to see. If we, like, I talk about because you know what a whale tail is when you see though with the, the underwear flukes. sticking out of the back of the pants. Oh yeah, oh, and yeah. that's a fun thing to say instead of because like you know it's disgusting to say like oh look at that whale tail. We go Dargo's flukes. Dargo's flukes. <laughs> yeah, that's, oh. how you, that's when you see underwear sticking out. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Well, the men prepared the whale boats with harpoons and rope, and the harpoons were sharpened one last time as the ship overtook the whale. And once the Essex was within a mile, three whale boats were launched, one commanded by the captain, one by the first mate, and one by the second mate. Where they were once sailors, they were now hunters. Yeah, they could put that other hat on. Yeah. No, it's kind of, it's fucking crazy what you have to do to hunt a whale. Yeah. I mean, it would be funny if they were just like hunting Chris Christie. Because <laughs> he's a big fat guy. See, again, <laughs> folk always forward momentum. Forward. Some of the best, most chuck current, chuck the, chuck most, chuck the chuck most current. Remember current. Bridge? Remember Bridge? Game? I remember, I remember Bridge, Bridge, Game. Bridge Game. I remember, Bridge Game. I remember, I remember his 2014. Yeah, I remember football too. Yeah, I yeah. baseball. Uniform. Baseball, yeah, 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 big football. Now each <laughs> whale boat competed to see who could reach the whale first, yeah. but they also had to make sure to not scare the whale away by making too much noise. So the captains of the whale boat had to quietly coax and cajole the men in a way that's both aggressive and oddly tender. A little bit of cheerleading. Uh -oh. Here's an example. And Henry, I want you to do this verbatim. Okay. Please course, do this verbatim. This is literally this is verbatim. Do, for heaven's sake, spring. The boat don't move. You're all asleep, see? See, there she lies. Scold. Scold. I love you, my dear fellows. Yes, yes, I do. I'll do anything for you. I'll give you my heart's blood to drink. Only take me up to this whale. Only this time for this once pull. Oh, oh, St. Peter, St. Jerome, St. Stephen, St. James, St. John, the devil on two sticks, carrying me up. Oh, let me tickle him. Let me feel of his ribs. There he goes on. Go on. Oh, oh, oh. most on, most on. Stand up, Starbuck. Don't hold your iron that way. Put one hand over the end of the pole now. Now look out. Dirt. Dirt. Man, dude, you trying to flirt with me, man? You were going to go kill this whale. Men get very close on the little boats. They do. I know they do. <laughs> now, on the first attempt at killing a whale on the Essex voyage, a 20-year-old named Benjamin Lawrence threw the harpoon. But when it made contact with the whale's hide, the once docile 60-foot-long creature Ooh. became a massive, deadly monster. Cool. With just one swipe of his tail, a sperm whale could destroy a whale boat. And indeed, when the harpooned whale got aggressive, a second whale came up from below and smashed in an entire side of the boat with one smack oh, of the tail. Sweet. I wonder if whales, <laughs> did whales call it go hu going human name? No, going. they were just trying to fuck. <laughs> they were just trying to live lives. Yeah. None of the men were injured, but both whales were lost. Days later, after the whale boat was repaired, the lookout sighted whales once again. There she's coming! <laughs> oh. oh! White froth and cream! <laughs> <laughs> and the boats were launched. After catching up to the whale, a harpoon was successfully lodged into the whale's thick hide, and the creature took off, dragging the boat on what was called a Nantucket sleigh ride. <laughs> That's what they do. They, so they stick the harpoon in, and then the whale goes running, and then you follow with the car, the, the boat being dragged yeah. by the whale, and then you slowly but surely pull yourself next to the whale by the rope. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that really happened. That happened in the first God of War and I think Red Dead Redemption. There is real it's education. They're teaching the kids. <laughs> They're teaching the kids. Do you also get, did you get radicalized by an e-girl trying to get you to join the Air Force? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to play the new Call of Duty Modern Warfare, but I've got to flip my entire political thought. <laughs> yeah, you really, yeah. I've really got to. I think to even to join, you're technically yeah. you have to give money to yeah. someone. I'm starting to think they had weapons of mass destruction. Yeah, oh, maybe, oh, maybe. We better go over there for freedom. <laughs> More like weapons of mass distraction. Oh, wow. Oh. Yellow cake. <laughs> I remember Hans Blix. Yep, I remember all this. Is 40. But traveling at speeds of up to 20 miles an hour, a whale could drag a 25-foot whale boat by rope and harpoon for anywhere between 20 minutes and 24 hours, Dang. depending on how much the whale felt like putting up a fight. Once the whale tired itself out, though, the crew would haul themselves within stabbing distance and there, the real carnage would begin. Yeah, it gets fucking gnarly. So literally the whale at this point is exhausted, yeah. probably near death. Yeah, yeah. Well, no. well, it's tired for certain. It's tired, yeah. yeah. Well, the harpooner and the mate would trade places so the mate could take the honor of the kill. And using a 12-foot-long killing lance with a pedal-shaped blade, the mate would stab the whale again and again to find the whale's vital organs. Yeah, it was not an exact science. Um, no. May I say, aren't they always in the same spot? 
Um, I mean, it's a very large animal. I mean, it's, that's the thing. It's not like you're dealing with like a bear. Like you're yeah. dealing with a, an animal that can be anywhere between 40 and 80, 80 feet, feet long. long. Yeah. Okay. You know, and that's the thing is that it's also one big tube. It's just two big guts. So yeah. you're just fishing around with right. this fucking knife sense. looking for the important ones. Yeah. Yeah. And well, the goal was to find a group of coiled arteries in the vicinity of the lungs because the head was too hard to stab the brain and the heart was buried deep within the whale. But when that coil was punctured, everyone knew because in author Nathaniel Philbrick's words, the whale's spout would transform into a 15 to 20 foot tall geyser of gore. Whoa. It's fucked up. It's like Nightmare on Elm Street when but Johnny Depp got killed. Yeah, it is, yeah. yeah. This would be met with a cry of chimneys of fire. Whoa. Yeah. That meant that the whale was drowning in its own blood and would soon be dead. Yeah. Oh. I mean, we've all been, we've all had a chimneys of fire moment though. Fun. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, yeah. After Buffalo Wild Wings. Yeah. yeah. The whale would then vomit and die in a pool of its own blood and puke in a nasty, drawn out death. It's very sad. Yeah. Now, once the whale was dead, the three whale boats would latch on and tow the 40 to 60 ton carcass back to the ship at a rate of one mile an hour. Whoa, they're yeah. cooking. Hey. Oh, dude. Usually they could expect to tow the creature about five miles. But once they got there, the entire crew turned from hunters to butchers and eventually factory workers. Who yeah, wears dude. the new hats? <laughs> Tony, <laughs> you're in charge of bringing the butcher hats. I don't know what I am unless I have a new hat on. <laughs> oh my God. All we got is these Dave and Buster's caps that say, I love being a cock. <laughs> <laughs> well, it said that whalers were or, some... I'm sorry, Dick's Last yes, Resort. Dick's Last Resort. 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 But also Dave and Buster's. I, every time I go there, I see so many guys wearing hats that say, I love being a cock. Yeah, it's different though. I think they're just selling them like it's merch. <laughs> yeah. Well, also speaking of death, you know, Buster committed suicide. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. It's true. Uh, that is true. Wow. Yeah, yeah man. Wow. If the, if the Lord of Fun can't live, I don't know what we're supposed to do. Yeah. Well, when it came to the first whale killed on the ill-fated voyage of the Essex, the corpse was tied to the starboard side. Pieces of blubber were cut from the whale and lowered into the blubber room below decks, where it would eventually be processed into oil. Once all the blubber was stripped, the sperm whale's head, which constituted a third of the sperm whale's total length, wow. it was cut off and hauled up to the ship's deck, pouring out blood and gore. Yeah. It's so gross. <laughs> it's just like, it it's just must lot. have been so fucking it's gross. Really ploppy. A lot of plop, 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 plop. plop, plop, plop. Yeah, yeah. And they also built these giant kilns that were on the boat, right? So the, they had these like brick ovens in the center of the boat that would be used to boil the blubber into the oil. Yeah, and we'll get for to artisanal the... pizza. Yeah. Yes, yeah. yeah, it is definitely from fin to table. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. we'll mm. get to the boiling of the blubber here in a second. Oof. But once they brought up the head, a hole would be cut out of the top of the skull and men would climb inside the oh, head yeah. with buckets to remove all the spermaceti they could get their hands Die! on. I love the feeling of, I love the smell of spermicide in the morning. <laughs> Absolutely. Because you a... just get right in there, man. Mm -hmm. they, would just, they would just be scooping out with their hands because they want to get every little bit of it. Yeah, spelunking spunkin for sperm. Hey, spelunkin for spunk. There you yeah. go. There you go. Well, after spunkin. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, after that, the men would return to the body and probe the whale's intestinal tract with a lance, searching for another substance called Ambergris. Well, that's going to be full of shit. Yeah, it, it was. That's the basically thing. Basically, is it, it's the they're doing the worst possible shit. But guess what it was used to make? What perfume? Ugh. Poopy perfume. Perfume. No, I know, but was it the hum It was the whale poop that made the perfume? I know no, it wasn't what. whale poop. It was something like it was some sort of disease. Um, it's, if the I perfume can, perfume was made out of a disease. Basically, I think what it was. It was sort of like uh, if you. Crust it's a out. solid, waxy, flammable substance yeah. of a dull gray or blackish color. If you cr like, kind of, if you crusted out somebody's uh, arteries, yeah. you know, like fatty arteries, uh -huh. it's kind of like if you yes. crusted that out and then made perfume out it's, of it. And that and smells it is, good. It's, it is used to allow the scent to endure much longer. Mm -hmm. But now they they figured out a new way to do that. Yeah, yeah. They and they said that, that sometimes, uh, and the dogs love it. <laughs> oh, good. Well, isn't that nice? And it was worth more than its weight in gold. Wow. Yeah. And the whale blubber would then be boiled in a process called trying out the whale. <laughs> See, when the blubber was boiled into oil, it produced cracklings on the surface. Oh, dude, that's not bad. You need a crackling. I mean, I, a good old crackling. Normally, yeah. I love a crackling. Yeah. 
but they would use they would skim off the cracklings mm. and use it as fuel, meaning the oh. whale was used to burn itself. Quit burning yourself. Yeah. One okay. green hand described the trying as having the quality of a quote indescribable uncouthness. Yeah, I right. feel that that yeah, I feel that it is indescribably uncouth. Yeah, but this isn't that bad. I mean, they just they gotta cook up the whale, they gotta prepare it. You know, they're also doing that on a deck that is covered in half an inch of blood. Uh there's guts everywhere, yeah. the carcass is, is Strewn, strewn all over and everywhere. everyone is covered in this shit for days at a time Probably actually blood. that used to be a trick that they play on the green hands is that with the green hands it, it smelled so awful and it was so terrible that the green hands would change out of their clothes after every shift what they didn't know is that your clothes are ruined if you wore them during the trying. Right. Uh, so what they would have to do is buy more clothes from the ship's canteen, and that's how the Green Hands got in a debt to the ship before Boom. they even came back. Perfect. Business on business on business on business. On business, yeah. There it is. It would be fun to make a bloody snow angel. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Fuck your mate. Fuck your mate. Typical Green Hand. Well, additionally, the smelly, thick, greasy black smoke created by this process smelled, in Herman Melville's words, quote, like the left wing of the Day of Judgment, an argument for the pit. Yeah. Wow. But then again, as you've seen, we talked about a little bit earlier, some of the more experienced whalers would go to what they say, love the smell, mm -hmm. because that means the expedition's going well. Okay. Well, this process went on continuously in shifts for three days. After it was all done, the deck would be mopped up, the corpse would be cut away, and the search for another whale would begin anew. Now, by the time the Essex had killed this first whale, they'd already been out at sea for four months. A poor showing by any measure. Yeah, one whale, four months? No, it was bad. Um, it's been bad. This was disconcerting to everyone on board, because remember, whalers made a share, not a wage. And the voyage wasn't over until the hold was full of oil. And there was no guaranteed exit to their contract. No. So also, they could be out there, are out there until the hull is full. Mm -hmm. so they're actively killing their product with no ability to, like, regenerate it as well. That so was gets, a concern to them. It's harder and harder Pope and harder. Pocahontas was wrong. Right? We said <laughs> wow. this at the top of the episode. Wow. Pocahontas was incorrect, because was Pocahontas in charge of Walmart? <laughs> I don't think she so. Wasn't. She had sex with the six-year-old man. Yeah. And she was 12 at the time. You can buy her action figure though at Walmart. You can that's buy right. Her toys. That's when the end. That's in the that's where she finally gets her comeuppance. You can also buy the <laughs> Guy Fox masks at Walmart and Target. It's, that's great. It is that's wonderful. Sharply ironic in yeah. the most dark won. way possible. They won. Yeah. And our board game also available at Target. Target! Good yes. work, guys. Absolutely. It's very fun. The only complaints I've had is from people who are too stupid to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> you mean us? Yeah, us, us, literally us. us yeah. Because yeah. they explained it to us and we we're like, well, we can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but no, people have loved the game. Now, once the Essex finally rounded Cape Horn at the southernmost tip of South America, they made their way up the coast of Peru where they finally hit some luck and oh. they began killing whales at a clip of one every five days. But just as things were turning around, the Essex met with the Aurora, owned by the same company and captained by the former captain of the Essex, Daniel Russell. Now, Russell told Pollard that he'd heard about a spot over 1,000 miles west of South America where another captain said that he'd fairly quickly filled up his ship with 2,000 barrels of whale oil. This is the competition. This it is a lie. It also doesn't make any sense because he just whaled it. It's like going. It's like trying to go on a slot machine after the person just won the jackpot. They're like, oh, this one's lucky. Yeah. No, you're a fucking moron. Yeah, yeah, I remember that when you don't win at a slot machine and they cover you in whale blood. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man, they got to stop this. Well, I mean, the reasoning was somewhat sound. It was like, okay, this guy killed all these whales last November. It's oh. May. When they're talking to each other, it's May of 1820. So you can go this November and then you can get the spoils this time. Oh. Well, I and, do, you know, and that's I, the thing. There are, at this time, there are millions of whales yes. in the ocean. It's not like there's like 15 whales that everyone's trying to whales. kill. Yeah. I will say it is, you know, I feel for the marine biologists that they talk to in all of these documentaries because mm -hmm. each one of them <laughs> literally on the verge of tears. Like they they're love all whales trying, so much. Like, they love whales. <laughs> whales are their life. And, they're, they're like, and the sperm whale can only really reproduce every five years or so. <laughs> Which I mean, of course, yeah, it's it's horrible. It's, it's horrible, tragedy, but it's, it's awful. A, it's tragic, but it's that too, where it's like, so they don't really repopulate that fast. No, 
No, they really don't. <laughs> like, uh, the sperm whales, we now know, we now have know. a specific language for each family. Each family, <laughs> and they have names for each other. They it's do. It's very sad. It's very sad. That very is sad. sad, yeah. Well, this new spot was called the offshore ground. And in reality, it was more like 1,500 miles off the coast of South America. Yeah, these guys really estimate a lot of shit. Yeah. The big estimations. From what we now know, the offshore ground is roughly the area around Tahiti and Easter Island. It's the South Pacific. So taking a chance, Captain Pollard decided to head into fairly untested waters because they were only halfway to filling their ship with oil after having been away for well over a year. And really, this is, again, not the worst decision. Had it not been for one fateful whale. And finally, he's nominated for an Oscar. Wow. <laughs> Now, before heading to the offshore ground, Pollard ordered his men to stop off at the Galapagos Island so they could farm for tortoises. Because true to form, whalers were a fucking virus that consumed <laughs> everything in their path in the pursuit of oil. Well, but tortoises they also had... are fun because they're also their own little bulls. Yeah, that, <laughs> it, it is sort of how they use it, but it's really fucked up yeah. what they did to the turtles. Because they were like, they had this idea of like, turtles don't eat. <laughs> what do you mean? Like, they just said, these just had this kind of like, fantasy like uh, idea real, that, that oh no a turtle you can just keep it on a boat because it doesn't eat yeah turtle, well, the turtle eat. does eat well that's the thing is that a turtle actually can go a year without or a galapagos tortoise can go a year without food or water because their oh. metabolism is extremely slow but to the yeah, to funny. the whalers this meant turtles don't eat turtles don't eat well for yeah. a year you know that makes sense yeah well tortoises they weighed between 80 and 100 pounds some could be as heavy as 400 pounds there's some massive tortoises out there and sailors loved eating Galapagos tortoises, which we <laughs> so now consider to be like one of the most precious animals in existence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another, well, one. another one, they're like, this is tasty. Why don't we cut off the head, throw the rest of it in the garbage? Yeah, excellent. <laughs> You'd eat it, Henry. You well, need a tortoise right now. I don't like turtle. Yeah. I've had Just because you don't like, like it. it. Yeah. If you loved it. Yeah, sure. It'd be great. I'd love it. Yeah. yeah. Wipe them out. But I, <laughs> but I ate it. I think it's gross. But yeah. it was so also, let him live. It was the turtle just competing with the dolphin and the whale. So turtle meat is probably much better. Turtle meat was top because it was lean and tasty. It and was you can a white make a soup. meat. You, you can oh, yeah, make, you a can make a soup. Yeah. yeah, and their necks are actually full of fresh water. So that's an extra source of water. That's it's a straw. Not tasty. It's not Poland Spring. But they're <laughs> no. like little straws. Yeah, they are because they grew up in an, they uh, evolved so in a volcanic <laughs> environment. It's so oh. fucking <laughs> it's so fucked up. And so the Essex crew disembarked and collected 180 tortoises for the rest of the voyage. Just imagine the a ed, this fucking crew of whalers just hauling off on the Galapagos Islands with a bunch of sacks and just getting all the turtles and taking all the turtles away. And then they stacked yeah. them like boulders in the hull. Yeah. And then the turtles that they couldn't stack, they just littered the fucking deck Let with them tortoises. It's kind of yeah. fun to have a bunch of turtles around. I bet you somebody was like, that's my turtle. You don't fuck with Oh, there must be. <laughs> well, I, I, I can guarantee there's a couple of them being like, that's my friend. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Well, because they're doing nothing for weeks at a time. Yeah, they're just sitting nothing. on a boat. Hanging out with turtles. Yeah, just talk to the turtle. You can play Hungry Hungry Turtles. <laughs> no, you can't play Hungry Hungry Turtles because they thought that they were not Hungry Hungry Turtles. Oh. Well, not content with depleting the tortoise population of the island, one of the harpooners lit some bushes on fire as a prank. Yeah, look at this thing. Look what I'm doing. Yeah, my <laughs> Is that fun? I, you thought I'd leave one thing alone. But <laughs> no, no, I could set fire to that as well. My uncle did that. Yeah. For uh, July 4th one day on accident. What? Uh, he lit a bunch of bushes. He threw a grenade and blew up a bunch of bushes. <laughs> oh, that's fine. That's in Wisconsin. <laughs> that yeah. You could set fire to a whole patch in <laughs> Wisconsin. Yeah, it was the yeah. 80s. I think no, it was the 80s. This fire burned down the entire island. Yeah. Like, it, oh. it engulfed the entire island in flames. And it was still a blackened wasteland years later. Never yeah. fully recovered. Oh. Still to this day, kind of fucked up. But it's like 30 years before Darwin. Yeah, Something it is. Like it's a long, yeah, by the time Darwin got to the Galapagos Islands, uh, not only had whalers completely just decimated the population, but San Franciscans had also discovered that turtles are super tasty. So mm. there was this pipeline from the Galapagos Islands to San Francisco. <sighs> I people just that. going, getting a bunch of turtles, bringing them back, I slaughtering all of them on the fucking just bay. Just being a turtle and just being like, you guys have beef. <laughs> you guys have chicken. You guys have turtle. pork. You yeah. have so many other far more delicious meats than us. How in the living fuck <laughs> did you find me? I'm covered in a protective shell. Yeah, I am. Right. There's all of it saying, don't eat me. Don't eat me. Leave me alone. Sailing thousands of miles to ground. All of you dying of scurvy. <laughs> and all of you just mm. eat this disgusting, wormy meat. I don't know. It's, uh, it's ready to go. 
Yeah. yeah. Again, it is a microwavable dinner of the sea. Yes. Now, to give you some perspective on how time worked on a whale ship, the Essex heard about the offshore ground in May and set course, but they didn't actually arrive there until, as I said, November of 1820. This is actually perfect timing because that was the month in which sperm whales were supposed to arrive there. It's presumed oh. that it was a breeding ground. By then, they were 1,000 miles from the Galapagos Islands and hadn't seen a whale in weeks, which raised tensions even further. Yeah. But finally, the lookout spotted a whale and first mate Owen Chase was the first to launch his boat. But before he could throw his harpoon, the whale surfaced underneath his boat mm. with enough force to throw Chase into the air and the creature escaped, further increasing frustration aboard the Essex and especially further increasing the frustration in Owen Chase. Bet you the turtles laughed, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm like, gotcha, <laughs> fucking <laughs> bitches. <laughs> Four days later, whale spouts were seen once again. But while the other two boats managed to harpoon whales, Owen Chase's whaleboat got smashed by a whale tail. Oh! Angered that he'd been knocked out of the hunt again, Chase hurriedly repaired his boat by very quickly and very loudly nailing canvas over the hole. Uh -huh. And he returned to the fray. This was a captain's idea. Yes. Because he was yeah. like, well, first of, mate's idea. Yeah, he was like, let's just fix this up real quick. Right? Yeah. We got to get him back out there. So instead of properly fixing it, we'll just nail this piece of canvas to it, which is kind of interesting. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen such a large whale tail since I was at the Outlet Mall in New Jersey. <laughs> See? <laughs> That's fun. Mm -hmm. Now, behind the helm of the Essex was cabin boy Thomas Nickerson, all of 15 years old. Oh. Because when everybody, like when the whale ships launched, almost everyone on board were on those ships. Only three people were left behind to keep the ship from sinking. I mean, that's where you want to be. Yeah. You want to be left behind in that oh, situation. Oh, very much so. Oh, very yeah. much so, yeah. Well, Nickerson later wrote that off the port bow, he saw very suddenly... <gasps> the largest sperm whale anyone on board had ever seen. An 80-ton leviathan, 85 feet long, as big as the ship itself. Wow. Yeah, and they, because we had sort of, you know, <laughs> we had run through a lot of the bigger whales already mm -hmm. because this was a bull whale, it was a large male whale, and that we've discovered at this point that, that we have been searching for these big whales because that's what fills up the hole, that's what fills up the hole faster than a little bunch of little uh, tiny I've whales, seen right? some documentary yeah, footage you know, on that. Yeah. And so he wanted to, but, so this was a rare fine and this thing was specifically extremely on the fringe of sperm whale sites it was very kind it was like almost like at first you're like yes look at all the oil and then you're eventually like oh no <laughs> they gotta deal with it yeah, yeah. Right from your grave. now whales rarely attacked ships usually opting instead for the whale boats that were obviously trying to kill it in fact in nantucket lore no whale had ever made a direct assault on the main ship or at least no one had ever returned to tell the tale of a whale attacking a ship. Whoa. But this was no order. You tell me it's a whale tale about a tale of a whale burning yeah, your boat? It's yeah. very good. It's very good. <laughs> it's, good. Very it's like kind of a limerick. But this was no ordinary encounter. This was the whale of Ahab. Oh. <laughs> The book. Oh. The book. The book. It's not he's the He's not whale. like an Instagram influencer. No, oh, I no, no, no. see. It's Captain, like the, it's Captain Ahab. It's a moment of like, it's a literary illusion. Yeah, you can you know the tale, the, the whale of Ahab covered in tattoos and stuff. Whoa. Oh, Corinne. Antifa. <laughs> Antifa. <laughs> <laughs> You're more like Aunt Tifa. <laughs> you really nailed it. We're hip. Well, swimming beneath the surface of the water with its head directly pointed at the Essex, the whale dove and came back up 35 yards away. And with a tremendous crash, it rammed the side of the ship, sending sailors and tortoises flying across the deck. <laughs> Man, what a day for the tortoise. He just got to be like, come on, can I get a break out here? The whale then swam under the ship and bumped the bottom hard enough to knock off the false keel. Then it resurfaced near the rear at the starboard quarter. Now, at this point, first mate Owen Chase actually had a chance to harpoon the whale and maybe save the ship, but he hesitated. Oh, Owen! But that was actually the right decision because the tail was dangerously close to the ship's rudders, and if the rudders were damaged, everyone would be fucked. And conventional knowledge held that this whale probably didn't attack the ship on purpose. Conventional knowledge, whales don't attack ships. So it's like, okay, well, I'll just get it the next time around. Have we thought about maybe removing those huge, perfect whale tits from the bottom of our <laughs> vessel? I don't know. I wouldn't recognize the boat without them. Yeah, it seems like this whale really wants to fuck. <laughs> yeah, but you, he probably did. Yeah. That is it kind of what they probably what it was doing was they're fucking. Uh, I, I, I don't there's know. There's a lot of theories. There's a lot of theories. But had Chase taken the chance, 
he might have averted the many tragedies to come. The whale, still in a sort of insane rage that none of the whalers had ever witnessed. I but- hate Velma! <laughs> I hate film. (laughs) Very good. It began snapping its huge jaws and thrashing at the water. Then it turned back towards the Essex at a distance of 600 yards. And at twice his original speed, it torpedoed the ship with its skull. It's, it is very cinematic. Like, yeah. they're yeah. just sitting on the boat, and you watch this thing, because they said it was stunned, right? So it was kind of, like, flopping next to it, and they're like, oh, what's going to do? And they watch it swim away, and they're like, oh, yeah. They're like, Thank God. Right, we're going to be over. And then just watching it turn around. Oh, no. <laughs> like, oh, holy shit. <laughs> and it just destroys, because they're talking about, like, it was like eyes of wonder. Like, that, the, the way they talked about, like, Ooh. when it just hit the boat, they're all like, this literally it's just never happened. We've never even heard of this happening. Yeah. Yeah, brutal. And with that, the Essex began sinking bow first. Nice. If you're a whale, this is a great day. You it's got all the food. Get. <laughs> well, one of the sailors, William Bond, had on his own initiative retrieved the navigational equipment in the officer's quarters and ran it back to the spare whaleboat being prepared for sea. Had he not done that, no one would have survived. Bond and the others made it just as the deck of the Essex was inches above the ocean's surface, and the great old ship capsized moments later. Two miles away, the third whale boat, commanded by Captain Pollard, could only watch as the Essex sank below the horizon. I mean, so much better to watch. I I mean, I (laughs) guess. Thank God we're not that guy. But you know that everything's fucked, because all of your shit was on that. Right, yeah. When Pollard and his men returned, they found the hull floating on her side, and each man stared at the wreckage in silence in what Chase called, quote, the paleness of despair. Hmm. By Owen's later reckoning, it was less than 10 minutes time between the whale's first attack and the eventual capsizing of the ship. So the lesson, take the chance when you can. Every day, take your shot. Take, take your shot. shot. Take your chance. Take your take shot. shot. You in, are Tell you in, Becky you like her today. Sure, <laughs> sure. Are you in the middle Harpoon of... Harpoon Becky in the belly and, <laughs> and, and drag yourself closer to her. Yeah. Mine her for her, her oil, her which amber, is her blood. Her, yeah. her amber grease cut off the top of her head and suck out her brain. You want to be a comedian, but you live in Mondovi, Wisconsin? You can pick up, you get on the plane, you go to New York City. You move City. to yeah. downtown Mondovi. <laughs> or, and you start, you start the Yuckle start, Hut yep. in downtown Mondovi. Mondovi. And now the 21 men were all huddled together in what amounted to large open air rowboats with only the clothes on their backs Ooh. and a bunch of now fairly useless harpoons. But all this begs the question why did the great beast attack? I hate Velma! <laughs> I know, I know. Well, author Nathaniel Philbrick believed that it may have been a case of mistaken identity. Hmm. See, sperm whales use a cartilaginous clapper system. <laughs> oh, tell <laughs> that's me how, more. That's how I can see where Kissel is. <laughs> in yes, <the> indeed. <laughs> <laughs> the cartilaginous clapper system uh-huh. is used to create a clicking sound that sperm whales use to see through echolation, and they use it to communicate with other whales. Here's what it sounds like. Well, Make thank you. Sure <laughs> to drink your oval team. Yes. All right. Oh, yes, huh? Eh? <laughs> 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 oh, that was a funny joke. Oh, you guys don't get the reference. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah, so. Now, the females have a more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so it was a quite droll. Yeah, it was quite droll. droll. Very funny. <laughs> Almost a British sense of humor in the whale. Now, the females have a Morse code like series of clicks. It's closer to what we just heard. But males have slower, louder clicks that whalers called clangs. And they learned to listen for clangs because a clang meant a bull. And that meant more oil. Sure. Clangs often sounded like the tapping of a hammer. And it's thought that when first mate Owen Chase nailed the piece of canvas to the bottom of his whaleboat in haste, he might have transmitted sounds that told this other whale that there was a competing bull in his territory. No! Yes, and he might have been there slinging his own, his actual cum. He might have been. He might have been, we don't know. And they're also saying, did he bump into the boat accidentally? There's some of that talk. They don't know whether or not he first hit it and he didn't know what it was. And then he's like, what? (laughs) <laughs> what the fuck you trying me? And then he came back yeah. around and he did it again. Yeah. Well, it was, or uh, what's the devil himself? Yeah, or it was the devil himself. 
<laughs> right. That's also another theory. Yeah, but it, it was more like be. that he wasn't trying to fuck the ship. It was that he was trying to kill yes. another whale that was trying to fuck his yes, whale. His whale. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen reality TV. I know <laughs> how this works. I've watched a lot of Bridezilla recently. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah. Not doing well. Well, this is why they have this theory. Typically, when a whale fought with a whale boat or a whale ship, it used its jaws or its tail. But whalers have noted that competing male sperm whales will attack each other in a similar way to how the 85-foot-long bull attacked the Essex head on. Oh. And while the Essex was indeed made of strong white oak, it was 21 years old and had gone through two serious storms during that last voyage alone. Oh, yeah. Making it no match for the Leviathan that attacked it. Cool. And ironically... It has since been found that the echolocation system in sperm whales seems to be built around the organ that produces spermaceti. Spermaceti. Whoa, so this thing was full of it. (laughs) Yeah, man, to the brim, frothing with it. And that means that the thing that the whalers were killing the whales to get was their eventual engine of destruction. Interesting. Wow, that's like being someone who makes wine who's killed by grapes. Yeah, oh no, I slipped on these grapes. <laughs> no. And I fell on my my artillery shell. I went up my ass. Oh yeah, that does happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we've seen that. Two different stories. Uh, like twice twice a year on twice side year. stories. Yeah. Somebody gets something shoved up their I ass. I fell. I fell. <laughs> and so Captain Pollard ordered his men to salvage what they could from the floating wreckage. They found two casks of bread, 600 pounds of hardtack, and several barrels of fresh water. Now, this sounds like a lot, and it was. I mean, no, no. Well, it was for a, a year long. It's a two lot to have. of fucking bread? No, 600 pounds of hardtack. That's a lot. What's hardtack? Hard, hard tack, bread. It's hard bread. It's like oh, a that really is hard. Bread. Yeah, it's a hard biscuit that you have to soak in water in order to eat. Which is difficult because they don't have any water. Yeah. (laughs) Well, actually, salt water might be good on that. No, it's not. Actually, they try. We'll get into why that's a horrible idea on the next episode. A little sardine. (laughs) Dehydrates you. But the thing is that even this was far too much for the whale boats to carry. The 25 foot long boats. There's there's like and there's seven guys in each of these rowboats. So they don't have a whole lot of room for food or for barrels, huge barrels of fresh water. Right. So they took what they could fit along with a lot of tortoises and a couple of hogs. <laughs> these are, are they ever eating these you goddamn hogs? To, it's, <laughs> it's hard because now you got to find the room to you got to take them apart. Yeah. Yeah. And after 3 days of salvaging what they could and constructing makeshift sails for their whale boats, they called them jibs. Oh, yeah. that is cute. Yeah. That is nice. The men were suddenly, quote, I love this phrase, bludgeoned with despair. Yeah, oh, I, they got feel, sad. I, I know that feeling well, a little bit, yeah. but not like that, not like being marooned on a boat. Yeah. Thousands of miles away from a coastline. No, but mm-hmm. just like being surrounded by a bunch of bread and pigs. Yeah. 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 I mean, like, uh, they can still be like all these bread and uh. pigs, but I can't eat them because none of them are prepared. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's hell. That's hell. That's hell. That's hell. Yeah, that's yeah. hell. Yeah. And some of the men began fainting from anxiety as reality set in and they couldn't eat or drink, which they this should have been when they were eating and drink, at least put kind of putting on some pounds because they were having to leave a lot of food behind, but they couldn't because they were so fucking scared. Oh, come on. How scared do you got to be not to be able to eat? I've been this, that's like this, a daily occurrence. That's no, different. Some of us no, react no, different. No. I'm an eater when I am scared. Yeah. You gotta no, build that. That's your that's technically your brain, your reptilian it's brain It's Mental your insulation, life. yeah. 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 Well, sometimes your reptilian brain tells you you can't eat because something is trying to kill you. Yeah. If you but stop then, to eat, then that thing is gonna kill you. That's that, mine. That's oh, when no, I release. No, no. You can eat the on the go. Is, <laughs> that's when you you gotta release scat. <laughs> If you release <laughs> scat, then they, the predator looks for your scat. And Absolutely. The yeah, exactly. scat is like, it's almost like a hologram you. Yeah, always. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, things I were... love that scene in Star Wars where <laughs> that was just scat. That scat. It'd be yeah. like, Darth Vader's here? Help yeah. me, Obi-Wan. Yeah. yeah. No, things were made worse than... <laughs> Obi-Wan's shit. Darth Vader. <laughs> yeah. Actually, what I was thinking about was Jar Jar Binks scat. Yeah. Because oh, Jar yeah. he was so scared yeah. when the poodoo came. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, you got the donkey poodoo or whatever the poodoo was. There was a lot of poodoo. I don't, I don't know what that was all about. I do like Jar Jar. I'm team Jar Jar. And without him, they wouldn't have survived because he knew how to fly. Or he we know. Knew how to yes, drive we oh, know. He could serve a function. Yeah. I think he, he didn't. Have... He didn't. He didn't know how to do the boat, though. He just sat there and screamed the entire time. Whatever. Yeah, he's funny he just, comic relief. Misa, Misa, so <laughs> Jar Jar. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. He's a funny comic relief. He just screamed. He was funny comic relief. But I think he would have little turds. I think he would have rabbit yeah, like turds. Like pellets. Oh, like yeah, pellets. Yeah, pellets. Or is it like that hippo video <laughs> where the? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I haven't gotten well, to that as... Disney Plus series yet. <laughs> oh God. <laughs> Well, things were made worse. Jar Jar shits. <laughs> Seriously. We're very close to that. Always moving forward. Close. Everything is content. <laughs> it's all content. 
Things remained worse the next morning when the Essex began to break apart. Oh. And the whale oil... <laughs> Jar Jar shit just hit him on a fucking toilet. Mickey me Mouse so- just masturbating in front of him. Me so <laughs> shitty. Oh, God, they won't let me They won't let me pitch. They won't hear my pitch. Dude, anymore. I know, man. I know. Oh. We, we had our chance as a pitch meeting. <laughs> oh, we had them. Starter logs. Yeah. So yeah. dramatically yeah. blew those <laughs> in a way that was... Almost watching our manager be so sad, and then we were laughing. Yeah, we were laughing. Because <laughs> we had no choice. And, uh, yeah. Well, the Essex began to break apart, and the whale oil that the men had worked so hard to harvest slicked around them in a reeking pool from which there was no immediate escape. Now, by noon on the fourth day, Captain Pollard had made his navigational calculations and was ready to discuss options with his first and second mate, of which there were actually quite a few. Okay. First, they could backtrack to the Galapagos Islands, 1,500 miles away. This was a bad option for multiple reasons. And likewise, Hawaii, that was also discussed. They knew where Hawaii was, but the small vessels couldn't survive Hawaii's storm season. They were right in the middle of it. Mm. They could also sail west towards the island of Marquesas, about 1,200 miles away, which was a pretty smart move. Marquesas had been a popular port for Chinese traders for decades, and the island of Tahiti was reachable as well. Both could be reached in less than 30 days. Sounds fun. But by 1820, Nantucket sailors had come to believe that many South Pacific islands were infested with cannibals. Coincidence? (laughs) Strange. See, a few years earlier, a U.S. Navy captain had published reports that in time of famine, the people of the Marquesas Islands would butcher wives, children, and aged parents for food. And another visitor to the island said that the natives greatly enjoyed human flesh and, quote, those who have once eaten it can with difficulty abstain from it. Oh, they just absolutely love it. I think coconuts <laughs> might be better. Oh, absolutely. But again, it's a, and it's also a bit like a, a fear of the unknown race. Oh, no, yeah. You know, sure. it's like you look at this thing and you kind of paint it being like, oh, no, they're primitive, so they must eat each other. Well, it's but a also, bit- uh, what's the spuds? They are, well, there was also within sailing life, cannibalism was kind of referred to as a thing that was like, well, they that called did it, happen. They called it the custom of the sea. That was their oh, euphemism. Oh, well, that's horrifying. Uh, it's kind of like cannibal holocaust in well, a way. Man, well, that's the thing. I mean, was cannibalism practiced on South Pacific islands from time to time? Yes. Sure. Was it cannibal holocaust? No. It is not. I'd give him my pinky toe. I'd be like, here's a little tip. Yeah, why don't you, why don't you, nosh, why don't you suck on that bone a little bit around? Yeah, suck on that bone. There's some good mar on there. And from what it seems, Captain Pollard probably knew this, especially since Tahiti was by this time home to a thriving English mission complete with a large chapel. But Captain Pollard's style Mm. of captaining was decidedly more democratic, Mm. which was absolutely the wrong style in a fix such as this. I feel like when you're on a bunch of boats, right, and then everything's gone, you're fucked. Fucked. The idea of taking a vote at that point, you're like, let's just go with my fucking idea. You got to be a leader just sometimes. Then you get back to the democracy when you're on the boat, when you're on the land. But this isn't the time to check the polls, Owen. (laughs) No, you got to lead here. Well, Pollard knew that heading to the islands would increase their chances of survival. But most of the men were scared not only of the cannibals, but by the fact that the people on those islands also openly accepted and practiced homosexuality. Which is just like you're on a boat, bro. I know you're seeing, I know that you you provide comfort every (laughs) once in a while. I know you see a man hurting for it. Yeah. Yeah. And you're sitting there and you're like, arr. Yeah, I so could get in them. Their homophobia was so deep. They're marooned in the middle of fucking yeah. nowhere. It's possible going to be whale meat at any time. But the idea of seeing another man's ball sack was like, I'd rather have this. Yeah. I mean, I'd well, rather eat ball hard sack all day. It was both things combined with each other. It was like, not only are they cannibals, but they have sex with each other. They, they, lo- they have love sex with I mean, come each on. Other. We're here at sea. Yeah, we'll suck each other's dicks all the fucking time, but they, they love they each other. All right, love. They, they Private they Ben Shapiro, <laughs> that's really not the biggest <laughs> deal. <laughs> yeah, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter. A woman should only be wet if you dunk her in a pool. She <laughs> should push her in a river. I know you're such a you're a manly man. You're a man. Can you go back to please cleaning out all the turtles? <laughs> and so instead of hanging out with a bunch of chill gay dudes in Tahiti, probably having a wonderful time. Incredible. Oh incredible. man. <laughs> Chapter seven. Margaritas. Yeah. <laughs> Chapter nine. Pina coladas. Pina coladas. Uh, wow, this this <sighs> really this really jumped the shark there, mm-hmm. Herman. Instead of that, they went with arguably the worst option. Great. They decided to follow the easterly trade winds back to the coast of South America, fifteen hundred to two thousand miles away, by their reckoning, where they'd hopefully be picked up by another whaling vessel. And this All would become this known. Would've... This would become forever mem- uh, memorialized in the writing as the fatal error. Mm-hmm. 
All that had to happen was one dude had to raise his hand, much like they did in the 90s, and say, Brother, they're gay. More pussy for us. <laughs> and then everyone would have been like, More you know pussy what? for us. Holy yeah. fuck wow. you shit. Brother, my paradigm. <laughs> she is it. Flip it. Flip the paradigm. As a result, and trying to avoid cannibalism, the crew very ironically guaranteed it. Oh, man. And that's where we'll pick back up for Woo! the conclusion to our series on the tragedy of the Essex. Yep, yep, well, yep, 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 yep. And that's why it's good to be skinning on a boat. Yep. It really is. I'm I'm starting to think I'm a little pro-whale. Yeah, man. We all are. We all are. We of all course. are pro whale because it all comes down to it. They they asked they they asked for it. You went out there. You went to try to hunt this giant animal. It just fucking sitting yeah. there. And then sometimes it's gonna fuck you up. Yeah. And then maybe we'll figure out. I I, I bet you because they talk about how many times these ships went missing. How many more oh. whales killed ships? Yeah. It must have happened way more oh, than yeah. they just, ever thought that it did. All for fucking candles. For candle. well, candles, candles, no, it's candles were the part of it, but it was straight up. It's the fucking lubrication for yeah. all of the the factory the machine. Yeah. yeah, it's the l lubrication. Yeah, we'll get into it later, but yeah, it was, I can't wait. I mean, really, uh, what happened with whaling is yeah, we'll um, be slick with it. Yeah, we'll be real the, slick with the it. Next but yeah, two episodes, we're going to be completely covered in KY. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it wasn't until the discovery of petroleum in 1859 uh, that whale oil started going out of fashion. So you c compare it to Exxon Mobil. Yeah, Exxon Mobil was what killed the whaling. Industry. All comes back to lubrication, man. All of it. Well, fantastic. That's why I'm pro Exxon Mobil to this day. <laughs> <laughs> a brave stance. Yeah, I know. Wow, really brave. Thank you all so much for listening. Uh, do we have anything to announce? We have our Australian tour yes. in August. That has been so rescheduled there. completely. Um, I wait. would like to invite you out. I'm going to put up an information on my social media, but we're going to be doing a bit of a side stories live April 8th in Hollywood. Yeah. We're going to be in movie theater helping me promote a project I'm working on. I can't Tell me wait. Tell a project I'm working on called Disaster Man. But it's going to be a big, fun live show. I can't wait. So just come so out. Fun. It's going to be great. So we'll come out. We'll figure out. We'll give you more information and you as know, it rolls out. It's another classic last podcast booking. I got a phone call from Henry, and he was like, you don't mind a booked us on a show, do you? <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> absolutely not. Also another last podcast booking, because this is the first time hearing of it. See? It's for side stories. It's for side stories. You can just come You can just be entertained by us. You can just sit and watch. entertained by us. Oh, that's perfect. Why would I do that? Cause you can't get wow. it up. <laughs> wow! Wow! Can't believe wow. it. But also, if I'm if I'm, coming, would I, if I'm showing up in the audience, why don't I just come on stage? Well, why would I have sex with the cow if I can get the milk for free? <laughs> yeah, why would I have sex with this guy at the cow shop? <laughs> That's great. Well, um, just matter, you're not invited. You have an anti-ticket. You have an anti-ticket. Yeah, exactly. This is a ticket so you can go anywhere but here. Anywhere Absolutely. but here. Great. Perfect. Um, Sound, sounds good. Perfect. I'm gonna go. Well, I'll go watch a, a, a movie. Go watch one of your bands that you like. <laughs> Don't see Avatar 2. It's a waste of time. I heard it was fantastic. <laughs> it's fine. It's a screensaver that talks. Oh, but uh, but also check out Deep Dives. We're going. We're yes. having another season yes. of LPN Deep Dives. This time it is with the beautiful Nat Natalie Jean and the very talented Jackie Zabrowski. Yes. They're going to be doing beautiful Jackie Zabrowski. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. You know also, I mean, yeah. yeah. But I, but you guys can check it out. It's a based on the book series A Court of Thorns and Roses, Woo. which is this. Uh, it is a fuck book. Mm, it's it's fuck a book. series of erotica books Great. that's uh, apparently very thick. And so they're going to talk about it. It is this book series has ripped through the lives of our families. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, every woman in our sphere ended up getting addicted to these books. Horny. They're humming with it. They're yeah. humming with these fucking, these fey, man. They they did really deep dick. Absolutely. But it, Valentine's Day is when that will be. Mm, oh, fantastic. Nice. And thanks for supporting our little serious ventures. Oh, uh, yes. Open Lines and Hail Yourself. That's Monday and Tuesday at 6 p.m. PST. I've been enjoying, uh, we've been enjoying the phone calls and uh, just another little nice way to interact. I like yeah. to see the people in here. And the people. I got to meet Brandon Marshall. The, four, the, the football, football player. player. Wow. And he said, I said, I'm Ben Kitzel. He said, I'm Brandon Marshall. And it was very nice. And, and then he regards me now. Let's see? Great. He waved at me. That's, and I was like, yeah. that's, that's all I want to be at. I want to be the, hello, Mrs. Anderson. I, however, I would like to ask you, though, if Henry would have introduced himself, do you think that he would have kept noticing Henry because he's not, this? because you're the same size yeah, as Brandon Marshall? Yeah, he sees you as a thing that he can recognize. <laughs> well, I feel like he, he just is, he just throw towels at me. <laughs> no, no, I think he's a, we, we record next to each other, and I think he's uh, impressed with how energetic we are. 
Oh. Wow, he hates and I told us. Him, I that's told what him, means he fucking no, hates us. I yeah. told him what we cover. He's like, oh, that sounds, I was like, UFOs, aliens, fun stuff. He's like, that sounds really cool because, oh, he talks about football. So anyway, he can be a guest on maybe. Let's do it. That's great. That'd be great. That'd Let's be awesome. That's very attractive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, he's a big guy. Oh, and also, last comic book on the left, volume yeah. two. It is out it's and it's delivering. Yeah, we, we, got it, we got them in the mail. They look fucking awesome. fantastic. Uh, there's some great stories by some amazing writers in this. We got fucking Rick Veitch. We got James Tenian. We had David Mack do a fucking uh, cover, very cover for cover. it. It's wow. fucking amazing. It's, it's so cool looking. Yeah. It's great. It's beautiful. And I just, I'm. we put a lot of work into it, and I'm glad you can finally get your And hands unlike Playboy, I read it for the pictures. Okay, everyone. <laughs> yeah. Thank you all so much for <laughs> I mean, listening. I just had to turn around. Hail yeah. yourself. Hail Satan. No gain. Look at the legends. Leave the whales alone. Please. Stay away from Please. the sea. For now. They're you know fascinating, I mean? mysterious creatures. Until Let them they be. figured out how to build a military. <laughs> yeah. Because then they're coming back. <laughs> I feel like they're going to come for a revenge. Can you bring a big spear onto a carnival cruise and just start whaling on it? <laughs> mm. <laughs> just hang out by the hamburger buffet? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Yeah. Because they're big people. Yeah. I'm just, that's where my family was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my cops. <laughs> This show is made possible by listeners like you. Thanks to our ad sponsors. You can support our shows by supporting them. For more shows like the one you just listened to, go to lastpodcastnetwork.com.